in the roof. <clears throat> Okay, it's live now. Okay, uh, respected professors, uh, senior faculty members, dear colleagues, my dear friends, and most respectable, our invited speaker, Professor Tanmoy Bhattacharya, University of Delhi. A very good evening to all. So uh, we are happy to see you all to this episode of uh, special lectures on Languages of Tibet of Burman. Okay, let me mute it. Sorry, sorry for that. Let me mute it. Yeah. So yeah, we are ready. Yes. Uh, to begin with, uh, without wasting any time, uh, let me uh, request Dr. Pop Tang Haukif, President Sulani, uh, to deliver a welcome note on this occasion. Yeah, over to you, sir. Okay, good evening to everyone present for this uh, webinar. So once again, we are back to our old, what you call, uh, uh, talks on, uh, talk series on uh, Tibetan women languages. This we started uh, in last uh, October of uh, last year, uh, towards the end of the outbreak of the first pandemic. And now after I gave off, uh, say a few months, say around six months or so, and after successfully conducting a series of events uh, with, respect to, with respect to the languages of Northeast India, belonging to the Tibetan Burman family, we are back to uh, this talk series. And as part of this uh, event, uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, in our midst, uh, Professor Tanmoy Bhattacharya, University of Delhi, uh, so, uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Tanmoy has been working on all language families of India, uh, as far as my understanding goes. So, uh, he, will, he is the right person to relate to us how Tibeto Burman languages uh, relate to other language families. So, in terms of typological feature or other syntactic properties. And today we have such uh, an interesting topic. Uh, so despite our geogra geographical separation, so we tend to share lots of typological or even uh, what it was syntactic features with uh, the Dravidian languages. So he's uh, going to take us into this uh, forest of our, uh, untold uh, similarities between the two language families. And as usual, uh, Professor Tanmoy is uh, not only a professor in linguistics, he's very dear to Northeast India, perhaps. Uh, he's uh, like uh, our own, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, Northeastern folk. And our uh, madam is also from uh, Northeast India, from Manipur. So <clears throat> these are the, the few people we have in linguistics. So unfortunately, there are not very many uh, active uh, linguists, so many senior linguists have retired and then we are left only with few senior professors and Professor uh, Tanmoy uh, has shown his, uh, what he called his uh, expertise on the subject of syntax and also other language documentation and aerial features. So we are very happy to, uh, sir, that you have uh, always um, consented to our request. Uh, our Tiblane Association is, uh, unlike any other association, is a young association. Out of some enthusiasm that uh, we build up, we have been uh, forming this um, uh, Tiblane Association. We have no funds, so we are in the evolving stage, rather. So we are in the, in the very beginning of this stage. So we hope that we can take up the uh, Tiblane to a further, further hedge and explore uh, more about the the under described languages, the features, some of the very interesting features of Tibetan Burman languages, what relationships uh, do they have between with other language, language or language families in Southeast Asia in general. So <clears throat> once again, uh, I 
as a what do you call uh, not a formal uh, president we have not had an uh, election just a caretaker president uh, would like to welcome you on behalf of my colleagues and my fellow members of the planning to this very important event and without further wasting our time i hand over the rest of the program to the uh, coordinator thank you sir Okay, thank you, sir, uh, for your <clears throat> welcome note and highlighting the Diplani activities in the past year. So, uh, without wasting any time, uh, let me invite uh, Dr. Monali Longmalai, Secretary Diplani, uh, to introduce the invited speaker and to take over the talk. Over to you, Monali. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bijan, for giving me the opportunity to be the moderator of the session. Uh, for Professor Tanmay Bhattacharya's talk on um, uh, basically on Tipacha Burman, relating Tipacha Burman to Dravidian and unfinished story. Uh, before uh, Professor Tanmay sir begins his talk, I'd like to give a brief background of his uh, profile. Um, Professor Tanmay Bhattacharya has done his PhD from University College London 1999 as a Commonwealth Scholar and joined the Department of Linguistics, University of Delhi in 2001 as an associate professor after a postdoctoral stint as a research scientist in the Cognitive Science Group of the University of Leipzig, Germany. He has been a professor of linguistics since 2009 and his uh, areas of specializations um, are syntax mainly, and also he guides uh, researchers on uh, sign language, psycholinguistics, parsing, conversational analysis, gender and disability. He is also the founder secretary of FOSIL, um, which is um, basically for syntax, uh, formal study of syntax and semantics uh, in Indian languages. Um, he also works in disability studies and has uh, been running a reading group called Critical Disability Studies in India since 2012. He has had uh, numerous uh, paper publications and he has delivered talks across India and abroad and also uh, paper presentations and mostly his uh, works have been on linguistics and disability or linguistics disability. Uh, one of his uh, most recent presentations um, or three of his most recent presentations to be more exact, uh, were in Tiblane, IC Tiblane one in June, 2001 itself. Um, uh, basically on argument and agreement in uh, Tibetan Burman languages and Kukichin with his scholars and himself. Um, he has also uh, recently published the first issue of the online peer-reviewed international journal called Indian Journal of Critical Disability Studies, um, edited by himself and Anita Ghai. And um, he has also been appointed as associate editor of Linguistics Variation, published from John Benjamins. And he was also the editor, uh, previous editor of Indian Linguistics from published from CIL Mysuru. And um, I'd like to welcome our speaker for today's session, Professor Tanmoyser, to kindly uh, begin your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Welcome for introducing the society and um, the context. Monali for introducing me, a detailed introduction, and Bijan, of course, coordinating this meeting. I'm very happy to be here, goes without saying, for a very special reason that uh, Pautham already mentioned about my special association with the Northeast. <clears throat> I've been, uh, till very recently, um, going to <clears throat> Manipur University and giving talks every year <clears throat> and uh, have been working on Tibeto-Burman languages uh, as Dr. Hawkeep said, uh, also looking at typological interconnections across um, the land that we call India. And I'll actually begin <clears throat> with an important issue and uh, just to give a little, uh, let me first share because I might just forget the most important thing. Share the presentation. Okay. I hope it's visible to everybody. The title page, yes. yes so a yes. uh, little bit of background um, of this talk. Um, 
Monali just mentioned that I was uh, an editor of uh, Indian Linguistics Journal. In fact, that was the uh, the year it technically started. The editorship was uh, December, you know, that election and this eco LSI meeting, December 2014, in uh, Trivandrum, and that's where I <clears throat> uh, presented, you know, part of the story. It was not so well developed, but the main skeleton of uh, the paper was already there at that time uh, in um, in a workshop that was, uh, I think, organized by uh, myself and Umarani. And Professor Subarao had given a presentation and uh, late Rahul Balusu was another speaker looking up at the Dravidian side. <clears throat> so that was the beginning of this interest, but Previously, before that, for almost a decade, I have always wondered from my linguistic studies, especially from my work in syntax, um, which is my specialization, uh, of the close connection between these two groups of languages, tibeto burman and Dravidian. Um, a a kind, kind of connection which is extremely important in the sense that there are certain constructions in these two groups of languages which are um, uh, absent in Indo-Aryan. Of course, you might think that what happened, what happened to the fourth you know, major group of languages and that is very much part of the part of today's story. And the puzzling thing about this paper is that uh, if it is so, then um, how did it happen? You know, that was the beginning of the interest. Uh, and uh, uh, after that, I, because of this interest, I um, ended up actually producing so-called non-technical uh, um, a series of articles in uh, Northeast Scholar. And there's a journal published from Imphal. Uh, five articles um, titled Peopling of Northeast India. Uh, and um, many of the things that I will discuss today uh, appeared in those, but not, of course, many other things which I don't have time or space to discuss. Now, uh, why it is important, that is what I'm going to talk about. And then also as a matter of introduction, I would like to say, you know, how come this was something which did not actually uh, catch anybody's attention earlier. And here is one special um, reason which I think is true, therefore I should say, um, you know, when we look at languages, especially when we compare languages, when we compare types of languages, we tend to look at their, uh, first of all, their sound related properties, because that is also obviously the first thing that attracts us to understand the difference or similarity across languages. And as you know, as students of linguistics, you would know that uh, when there's language loss, there's language disorder, that's one of the first thing that goes, right? And of course, when young children acquire language, that's one of the first thing they acquire. So sound is very surface, a very superficial phenomena, a surface phenomena. Unfortunately, the uh, work on variation from, mainly from sociolinguistic perspective, looked at for several decades only at sound. And from the 60s, early 60s onwards, 1960s onwards, uh, and uh, a morphology, right? Um, social linguistic studies did not look at syntactic variation for a very good reason that it is very difficult to capture. And there are very few people who can really understand syntactic variation. But the scene has changed a little bit since the last quarter of a century. So 25 years, uh, people more and more uh, syntacticians and unfortunately only very few social linguists have started taking interest in syntactic variation. And the reason that I hit upon this similarity between Dravidian and Tibetan woman is because of my interest in syntax. Otherwise, you know, MNU has looked at it Several other scholars, everybody from a long time have looked at this and came up with the idea of India as a linguistic area, but majorly on the basis of phonology, phonetics and morphology. 
So there's huge discussions, long discussions on retroflex sounds, on classifiers and um, verb say, etc. But um, no important work on syntactic variation across languages. Uh, Professor Subara's work must be mentioned and his book from Cambridge University Press, looking at, in fact, um, sentences, if not from a syntactic uh, framework, but sentences um, could be considered as the first sort of, you know, foray into uh, uh, this way of looking at um, comparing languages uh, at the sentence level, not necessarily at the sound level or morphological, that is word level. So that's a brief background. Let me start with the plan first. There are three parts and I hope I get to all the three parts. First is the importance of this study. And I'll show that what this study lies in how we understand a nation linguistically. As I was talking during five minutes before the actual meeting began with uh, the organizers that this is a very, very important topic. And uh, <clears throat> keeping the context that uh, Pauthan gave to this, my connection with the Northeast and the situation in Northeast linguistics. I think this is something which requires much more elaborate discussion in future. But I will lay down some of the basic areas of further investigation. And hopefully there will be another platform, if not here or another occasion here, where we are able to discuss this in much um, elaborate fashion. Part two of the talk will be um, uh, in fact, looking at the Tibeto-Burman and Dravidian connection, this I call as an axis, a hidden axis, okay, undiscovered axis, yet at the same time, very important because not only it relates, this part two relates to part one, that is, it tells us more about how a nation is to be understood, okay, and secondly, it relates to uh, one of the deeper questions of linguistics is that uh, what um, counts as genuine explanation? Okay, I'll come to that and talk about it uh, uh, later. So um, I think major part of the talk will be covered by these two parts. The third part is difficult for me to shorten. Therefore, I've not been able to shorten, but I have deleted many much information. Uh, but fortunately, this information is available and uh, other published sources of mine and interested people might be uh, able to look it up. Uh, this, in fact, is the reason why I'm giving this talk because after a little talk of 15, 20 minutes or half an hour in the first uh, conference of uh, uh, Tibetan Roman Linguistics in Northeast uh, India, that was organized with this by this group. I presented a paper where I talked about uh, migration, evolution, etc., with the focus on the Northeast. And people showed interest to uh, listen to more of that. So uh, that's the part which is uh, remains unfinished as far as this talk is concerned, because I'm not to, I will not have the time to talk about all of this. So let me begin and uh, you know, the first thing that I would like to um, say is that uh, the, uh, uh, with respect to part one, uh, I'll be looking at two very specific themes. Okay, and I'll, the first thing I'll discuss in this slide, and these two slides can be considered as representing this title, how linguistically, uh, how to, the two is missing there, how to linguistically map or unmap a nation. Okay, let me start with a very familiar, uh, very familiar point, students of linguistics and those who are not non-linguistics, I know for sure some non-linguists are there in the meeting today. Um, uh, there is this concept of uh, Ayala, India as a linguistic area, which I briefly referred to uh, five minutes ago. Um, uh, one of the celebrated work is uh, Murray Aminu's work. Uh, of 1956, um, and we continue to teach that work uh, in various ways. Here is this uh, quotation, which is very relevant for us. Many languages of the Tibeto-Burman Burmese group in the Himalayas and in Assam are not, I've not given the full um, quotation, are, are not taken into account 
in constructing India as a linguistic area. So MNU didn't think it is important to include you know, the languages of the Tibet Burman group of people. It's not, you might think that, well, maybe he was not comfortable with these languages. And therefore, this part of the quotation I've highlighted, uh, just to, to give him the benefit of doubt, except that even before 1956, and certainly after 1956, there is work by him in collaboration with others on Sino-Tibetan languages of China and other places surrounding the Northeast. So it's not a question of you know, his unfamiliarity with this group of languages. He just didn't think it was important to highlight this group of languages. So I was very tempted to actually draw a map of India here, where you just cut out the Northeast part of the map, but I thought it would be unnecessarily um, provoking. So I didn't do it, but you can imagine that map. So this is a linguistic construction of mapping a nation, or in fact, unmapping a nation. So it doesn't find any mention in MNU's work. In retrospect, as I've shown elsewhere, this omission of MNU ought to be considered to have been very costly. The only new feature that MNU himself pointed out in that paper is the construction of classifiers. Linguistic students would know what classifiers are. You know, East Indian languages are full of them, but so are Tibeto-Burman languages. And uh, Munda languages. So it is a feature which is very much part of Tibet Burman and in fact much more widespread in another a little group in the northeast, Thai Kadai languages, so Thai like languages. So these, um, uh, this feature which is the only new feature that uh, MNU discusses in this paper, um, it's majorly available in Tibet Burman. And I remember a thesis, uh, MPhil thesis written many, many years ago when I was a student in University of Delhi in the mid eighties, we had an American student uh, doing his MPhil, Peter Kwetek, okay, with a Polish surname. And Peter did a, a dissertation. I don't know what, what happened to the dissertation. I remember uh, reading it when I was an MS student. Um, and it should be in the library, but it may not be in the library. He did a dissertation on the origin of classifiers and uh, as uh, concluded by people before him and after him as well, that uh, this has uh, originated, this uh, feature has actually originated in the Southeast Asia and came to um, East Asia, I mean, uh, Northeast uh, India and Eastern indo aryan languages. So these are examples, people who are not familiar with this, so in Bangla, when you want to say three books, you have you cannot say teen, uh, uh, the word for three and the word for books. You cannot say teen books, you have to say teen te. Okay, teen te, te, that uh, which comes in a very, very uh, weak fashion in, in the Eastern Hindi uh, type languages like the Magadhan languages uh, in some uh, uh, Magahi and Maithili. Uh, people still use um, a concept, uh, expressions like to, teen to. Uh, but it's very different from Hindi in the sense that you cannot just say three books or three girls as such. You have to put a classifier. And for girls, you have to put a different classifier than for <clears throat> uh, biscuits or books. So that's classifier. Um, so, uh, yeah, to go back to this, this is uh, a construction of India through its languages without the Northeast very clearly. And in many ways, this continues in the way typology is taught, uh, for example, in uh, many Indian universities without the necessary corrective having been applied. The corrective in bullet point three, for example, here, uh, four. Okay, so his conclusion is actually incorrect. But this continues uh, uh, to be an ongoing sort of mode of, um, you could say, domination or uh, absence. And I have in a, in a bigger version of this uh, paper, I would like to say uh, a name that I have given uh, this kind of phenomena, what we can do about it is uh, how to unsettle this, unsettle. Uh, we need to create some kind of discomfort. We need to reach out to organization like yours. We need to speak up 
at different fora to say that, that such studies actively reproduce a colonial reality. It's a kind of a re institutionalized reproduction of settler colonial, colonial reality. Okay. Uh, the second point is about um, the second point. The first point is about India's linguistic area. The second point in this part one is about uh, census of India. And I think census of India, which I have recently appreciated very much as an instrument, a very old instrument and unique instrument in the world, which also does the language census. Um, and it represents various kinds of phenomena, which if you have the patience and interest, can easily figure out from the census figures. But it's also, I think, uh, constructs Northeast as a minority space, okay? So uh, by missing the, let's say, the major axis operating within the Indian nation, let's say the paper today that I'm presenting, an axis between Dravidian and Tibetan Burman, that's nowhere to be found in census or in any of the studies. It ignores the kind of history and therefore a contemporary under, understanding of the nation remains, you know, incomplete or faulty, I would say as much as uh, faulty. Yeah. As a result, we invoke the so-called minoritizing framework to view the Northeast as a minority space. Okay, census does it very clearly. Census figures validate this minoritizing rhetoric. However, census also reveals the true diversity of Northeast that needs to be highlighted understood and I think personally, I think celebrated instead of invoking the secession, uh, I call it the secessionist psyche, okay? The secessionist fear that if you recognize diversity, you also admit secession, separ separatism. That's not true at all. Linguists will tell you that's not been true ever. So let's look at some figures. Recently in a paper I had shown this, we have so-called scheduled languages, the official languages of the nation of uh, India. We have 22 languages currently. 22 languages have been recognized official. Uh, in these 22 languages themselves tell you a story. There are 15 Indo-Aryan languages, four Dravidian languages, and two tibeto burman languages, one Munda language. Okay, So these are highlighted with different colors. And this is the eighth schedule of the constitution of India. Now, uh, this is not all. It says that 96% of the mother tongues of the nation, of the country, are claimed to be covered by these 22 scheduled languages. Okay. So thankfully, we have Manipuri, which is included, and Boro, which is included. Otherwise, it would have been like 99%. Okay. 96% of the mother tongues of India are claimed to be covered by scheduled languages. So not much has changed from the time of MNU to our census. 2011 is the latest census figures available. And by simple figures and percentages and numbers, they clearly indicate that it doesn't matter. Okay. So, of course, uh, being a constitution, we also have a list of non scheduled languages. Of course, I can't give all of them, but 99 non scheduled languages. Again, the composition tells you a different story. There are eight sort of Indo-European, I'm saying Indo-European, not Indo-Aryan, because it also includes English and Pashto. Okay, eight Indo-European languages, 13 Dravidian languages, so from four to 13, and 13 Austroasiatic languages, so from one Munda language uh, to 13 Austroasiatic languages, and 64 tibeto burman languages. Okay, a clear evidence that diversity really exists at the, at the margin, at the periphery. I have, I'm fond of saying this, I've presented papers on this, that diversity exists in the periphery. You see it in China, you see it in India, very clearly. Two very strong multilingual democratic nations, but the diversity is pushed. Why it is found in the periphery? Because it's pushed to the periphery. Okay, so that was my first part, and I'll start my second part, that by uncovering this hidden access, which the census figures or the teaching of linguistics or unmapping or mapping of nation through linguistics does not reveal, 
we are able to in fact invoke genuine explanations this is a very recent talk by chomsky i think maybe uh, not even one week ago maybe five days ago and i'm quoting from him it's a talk so i sort of scribble down what he was saying uh, how much of language can receive genuine explanation that is the real question that he's saying that's the cutting edge of research it's being pushed forward it's a hard problem a very difficult problem you have to satisfy the conundrum of something that is rich enough to yield acquisition from extremely sparse data and impoverished enough to have evolved very quickly okay um so evolved very quickly means in the blink of an eye in the evolutionary time frame if it take 100000 years 70000 years to evolve for language that's a blink of an eye in the evolutionary time frame so it must be simple enough to have evolved fast it will be it must be simple enough to uh, lead to full acquisition within two and a half years or three years a human child within two and a half, half years or three years is a, a, a fluent speaker of any language okay within that framework can we find explanations of interesting significant linguistic phenomena that seems to me that is chomsky saying that seems to me to be basically the task of the field okay so genuine explanation in linguistics now let me show you a figure which uh, uh, is familiar again to most of the students of linguistics if not all i'm titling this slide as architecture of language and it is an inverted y diagram inverted y the english letter y so those who are not able to see the slide can imagine an inverted y on the top i have written the word numeration you can easily replace it with lexicon or base okay and then in the middle where the y sort of bifurcate bifurcates inverted y bifurcates i have labeled it as spell out which was in the older framework known as the um, uh, point where you uh, uh, spill as uh, as uh, uh, you uh, separate the phonetic form that is sound and logical form that is meaning so these are the other two ends of the inverted y phonetic form on the left logical form on the right and to make it very simple you start with lexicon you come at a point where you split out and you have sound and meaning except that it is not really phonetic form is not sound and logical form is not meaning but i won't go into the details of that in this talk but for broad understanding this should be enough now <clears throat> what has happened in linguistic theory is that we have more and more evidence that uh, this is what is happening inside our head this is the model of computation of let's say one sentence okay so that's why i call it architecture of language it's a model of computation okay you take something from the base or the lexicon or numeration okay let's say five words put them together do certain computation at one point your mind thinks you are ready to speak automatically your articulatory organs start moving your lips open your lungs start getting activated you start speaking and a sentence comes out of your mouth at the same time almost parallelly you are also processing the meaning of that sentence okay so this is a speaker slash hearer model it's not that there should be a hearer speaker himself or herself will have to process before sort of uh, clearing out the sentence okay so that's the model and some people as i said are familiar with it and um this architecture of language can be uh, shown oh, okay before i come to the uh, next slide let me tell you more and more theoretical discussion has focused on the phonetic form to some extent and the logical form these are the so called interfaces okay so we are focused on the interfaces of language and generative grammar theory at least has gone on to find out the importance of interface so i'll give you one demonstration in uh, example in today's talk where the interface uh, issue is very important it sort of hi gets highlighted on its own <clears throat> so let's look at the next uh, this is a uh, example of this how this architecture of language works uh, very familiar let's say take english huh? the looting of the village villages was 
not condemned. The looting of the villages was not condemned, right? You cannot say the looting of the villages were not condemned. Even if you say village, it is still uh, was. So notice that I put an arrow with a red mark saying that uh, was is not getting its form, whether it's going to be was or were, from the previously, linearly previously existing word, that is villages, which can be plural, it can be village, the looting of the village was not condemned, or looting of the villages was not condemned. That means the plurality, if you have villages, is not reflected on the verb. That means language is not looking at the linear organization of words. And this same phenomena, very um, famously shown for polar questions or yes, yes, no questions. For example, you could say, um, you could say something like the student who has been missing classes is missing. Okay. So let's say the student has been abducted, uh, abducted. The student who has been missing classes is missing. It's not uh, uh, where missing because classes. So plurality is not coming from the immediately existing uh, noun, which means Linearity has nothing to do. Let's look at one of our languages. Let's look at indo aryan language, Bangla. So you can easily reconstruct this in any other language. The example I read out, Rani, je amar bhaier me, tomake chene. Rani, who is my brother's daughter, knows you. Okay. So here knows is third person agreement. Okay. You can try it in Hindi. You will also get um, gender agreement, number agreement. Bangla is a very weak agreement language. So only the person, third person. Now, next to it is you in this sentence. Rani, je amar bhaier me tomake chene. Tomake is you, dative or accusative. But it does not agree with that. No, does not agree with tom tomake. It doesn't agree with my, which exists in the sentence, which is first person. It agrees with Rani, the first word. Okay. So this is a very, very clear example that linearity in language or linear word order in language has nothing to do with computation of language. And same phenomena, you can see again, another example, a uh, very nice example. Uh, I, I constructed this example based on another example. Men who lie often shout. Now it depends on how you read this. You could also read it, men who lie often shout. That means the adverb often can modify shout or it can modify lie, two different meanings. Okay. Uh, now uh, consider this very similar example where I've just taken that often adverb and put it in the front of the sentence. Often men who lie shout, only one meaning. Often can only modify shout. Men who lie shout often, that's the meaning. Often men who lie shout. Okay. It cannot modify lie. There is some similarity across these three patterns and all of these patterns, and there could be like hundred other examples which I could discuss, which shows the same thing. And the thing very graphically I'll show uh, a little later, but first consider this fact. Okay, we just saw in these three examples that linearity has nothing to do with language. And the next slide is titled as abstract insight hyphen graspable outside. I already told you the outside is very graspable. Sound, sound is the surface phenomenon. You know, first thing children acquire, first thing uh, any kind of language disorder loses, uh, language accident loses. And that's the first thing the uh, variationist look at. Okay, abstract inside, graspable outside. Because the outside is the one you can hear. Of course, you can see immediately that's a hearing majority perspective as well. This means that the child ignores 100% of the information from linear order and uses something which it actually never hears, an abstract structure that the mind constructs. The linear order on the structures is not a part of the language. It is a part of the mapping of language to the sensory motor system. This speaking is an accidental thing. We started speaking. We need not have spoken. We could have just looked at each other and we could have had an eye language, okay? But we started speaking and uh, the inner language, the inner uh, structure had to adjust and produce sounds. So it's a very imperfect mapping 
from an abstract structure inside to this very less abstract and concrete outside. This is the simplest possible computation that is naturally available to the child. The outside is not something the child uses at all. All the knowledge about the structure that the child uses is innate or it is inside. That means communicative efficiency is sacrificed in favor of computational efficiency. The articulatory system cannot produce structures, right? Phonetics cannot produce structures in the sense that syntax can. It can only produce words and sequence. So the internal system that is creating thoughts and so on has to be uh, turned into a linear system. That is a hierarchical system. We are squishing it and turning it into a, flattening it to a linear structure. And that's what the infant is doing. So um, next slide is titled, how and why? And I'm giving very abstract structure here. These are two uh, triangles connected. On the left is the triangle representing, let's say the subject of the sentence. And on the right hand side is the predicate of the sentence. Okay. So um, a little more detail. What we notice in these three kinds of sentences that we noted earlier is that something more is associated with the uh, subject. So let's say, Rani, who is my elder brother's daughter? Okay, who is my elder brother's daughter is a relative clause modifying Rani. Or if it's a student who has come late in the class, a student who is missing classes, who is missing classes is a sentence, a clause which modifies the student. So this green color shaded triangle associated with the subject is the extra thing, right? It is lower. Now, um, let's see how the verb is connected. Okay, in uh, number one example, number one example was the English example where we had this, uh, the, uh, uh, the torching of the villages or uh, looting of the villages uh, was not even condemned in the local newspapers or national newspapers. Okay, so there's was, that was is connected with the subject. Okay, not with villages, which is lying inside that shaded triangle. That is number one. And number two and three examples that we saw, the Bengali example and the example with the adverb. Okay, men who shout often lie, or often men who shout lie. So there often is connected to lie. Okay, so that's, uh, or, uh, or shout, sorry, shout. Men who, uh, often men who lie shout. So often is connected to shout. So that is shown by the blue arrow. So this is actually our uh, broad abstract structures for the examples one, two, three. And I put the subjects and objects, etc. Now, <clears throat> what I will show, and uh, you know, um, this slide, next slide should have been, or next modification on this slide should have been, or next slide, I think, should have been a little later, but I'll show this, that we'll go back to the, architecture of language. And I'll try to show that on the right hand bottom side where I had written logical form, which was equivalent to meaning, also may include things like discourse, okay? Or things like even more, um, uh, or more uh, surprisingly, cultures. And how is that? So let me go through quickly um, uh, the issue that I will highlight a little later. But let me now introduce this puzzle, uh, one puzzle that at typological, morphological, syntactic and semantic levels, deep similarities exist between Dravidian and Tibeto-Burman languages, although they, these languages have never been in contact. Okay, and further the syntactic similarities between Dravidian and Tibeto-Burman do not are absent or missing from Indo-Aryan languages. This makes the situation even more baffling. Okay, so let's look at some examples quickly. These are the linguistic part of the talk. So you could say uh, it's still part two, but it's linguistic part. Um, negative verbs. In the abstract, I wrote negative verbs. So Manipuri example, I haven't given Dravidian examples, but can be constructed. Tombana, nga, yamna, chad, yamna, chade. Okay, tomba does not eat a lot of fish. Now, not, uh, 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 does not eat, doesn't eat that is just by putting a negative marker within the verb. Then also very famously in Austroasiatic, Dravidian and Tibetan Burman, you have 
so called verbal reflexives or reciprocals so there is an example again from mithilon tombana masabu uh, ujai that means tomba saw himself okay tomba saw himself so tombana masabu is himself okay you can actually make it longer but this is the essential part and ujai so that the ja u is c ja part is actually reflexive or the self morpheme it's very different indo aryan speakers cannot construct an equivalent example like that there you have to say apne aap ko dekha khud ko dekha but dekha saw that verb form will not include any indication of the reflexivity but here in these three groups of languages you have to have that it's an essential part then another thing linguists know and talk about is that relative clauses again in these three languages you find more like very closed net relative clauses so this uh, uh, again mithilon example nasi chatpa nupadudi this means today a uh, going boy okay you can construct this in indo aryan but sounds very odd aaj ka gaya hua ladka okay jaane wala ladka aaj ka jaane wala ladka in very minor context you can use it and very uh, um, uh, rarely that structure is used uh, normally you have the jo wo kind of structure of relative clauses in indo aryan then nominalization and cleft question are the two parts i will go through in some more detail so i have not given example nominalization i have this idea which i actually presented again some something long time back um, it's a big strategy in manipuri i've looked at and i think it's true for tibetan burman languages that they highlight uh, you know they sort of factualize the language they highlight uh, turn things into nominal expressions or facts okay so a verbal basis can take nominal inflections and you can turn it nominal uh, um after they have been nominalized but verbalizing process is not so rare so for example again uh, you can use the word up to how ba then you put ba it becomes a nominalized meaning then together you put ba uppa then you get nominalized meaning so so on so forth there is an example sentence example i have given makoi loina hatta hopni okay all of them are together it's very difficult to construct a equivalent in indo aryan languages hmm. so this uh, again in huppa here is nominalized and we'll see also in relative clauses which we just saw again in the first example nupi di na du pha ba pammi so here pha ba that ba again is a nominalizer the woman wants to catch fish okay so catch is not a uh, verb form it has been nominalized and similarly you see uh, also in the other examples and these examples are taken from published sources most of them most some examples are mine so this was the claim i made in 2013 that mithilon has a genuine propensity for deriving states of affairs or facts uh, that uh, that's how the language behaves this strategy spreads through much of its constructions it is a deliberate move to factualize the language of course there is much more to say about this and in fact i have a philosophical sort of uh, philosophical semantic logical analysis of this uh, because it reminds us of what husserl said in 1900 that names are related to uh, things and sentences to states of affairs in particular what is asserted is an assertion of a state of affair russell similarly said a long time back in 1918 lectures on logical atomism the first truism that i wish to draw your attention to is the world contains facts when i speak of fact i mean the kind of thing that makes proposition true or false and then uh, lastly wittgenstein a later philosopher 1922 in one of his famous texts he said the world is a totality of facts not of things so um i think this is a very relevant connection that one needs to make that this is a propensity in the languages in the ling linguistic group and i think this is probably true also for dravidian that there is the tendency to nominalize and we need to find some formal apparatus which can address this issue okay let me move on to the second and the last demonstration for the linguistic facts which is cleft question i have done this in uh, uh, earlier so i'll go through it quickly 
So uh, an ordinary question is like, where are you going in English, right? But you can also do a cleft version of that question. Many languages prefer that. What is it that you are? Uh, sir, uh, is... just a little intervention. Um, so you have uh, five minutes. Uh, five right? minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's, yeah, so you yeah. can take a little longer, but um, okay. just I'll to try. remind you. Yes. So a cleft version of the, thank you, Munali. Uh, uh, cleft version of the question is, what is it that you are? Where is it that you are going? So what is your name? What is it that you call yourself? Now notice that you are changing one simple sentence, a proposition, a interrogative question into two parts. And you are doing many other things grammatically. It's very interesting. It's been well studied in Dravidian. And you know, one of the uh, researchers is, is among the audience. Uh, Professor Srikumar has studied it, but before him, Professor Madhavan had studied uh, and others as well. So here is a Malayalam uh, example. Ninne talli aada aada ar an. Okay. You, uh, who was it that beat you? And you get it. Uh, you guess this copula, the is, and you get the nominalizer. Very similar to my Thilon example. Nangbu phubadu kanano. Okay. So here also you have a um, sort of two structured um, sentence, not one. And it is a cleft form. Uh, Hindi, if you try to reconstruct this and Bangla similarly, it sounds horrible. Tumko marna marna jo kon hai. Completely garbage. Okay. Uh, you can put wala and all that. Even then, it's very bad. Now, uh, I did many years ago, uh, study this in Methylon in detail and did this Prat uh, version of these two Examples. I'm sorry that I didn't put the examples down there with meaning. Naram gari varibadu kanano kananeno and naram kanane gari varige. So avaruge. So here one is a cleft version, other is a non cleft version. Okay. And these two versions, the thing to notice the black and the uh, red in the graph patterns are very similar. Okay. And you can, I've given the, the scientific uh, parameters like duration, mean intensity, mean pitch, etc. But, uh, you know, the point is that they're very similar. Okay, so what is going on? Uh, what is going on is that this breaking of a question into this kind of sort of non-question form is a deliberate strategy of these speakers, the Dravidian and the uh, Tibet Roman speakers. And why are they doing it? Well, very good reason. One reason that I have done, uh, found out for myself in uh, my research is that a direct question may sound uh, slightly offensive, right? Where are you going? There is a possibility that it may sound offensive and to take out the offensiveness or nature of the question as a form, question as a grammatical form, you sort of make it a non-question. At the same time, you also want to have an answer you should have a in the language this is not devoid of question answers you need questions and answers interrogation right so i think this is indi this indicates a cultural archetype okay the observed lack of question intonation is in consonance with the cultural etiquette of how a question should preferably asked in manipuri culture that is by not raising intonation okay by not raising intonation now the problem is if you don't raise intonation, how are you going to convey that it's a question, right? In some ways, a direct question like, where are you going, can be construed as rude in a culture that values the politeness intricacies in a conversation to a higher degree. So my question remains that how do you uh, identify your statements as a question? So cultural sanction against rising intonation in a question seems to be common across Dravidian and Tibet Burma. This cultural commonality of intricacies of politeness indicates the possibility of an ancient archetypal cultural community, which I will identify as foundational Indian. Okay, so I hope some of the stuff I was saying in part one will make sense. But what is more important is that, <clears throat> is that this uh, um, question remains that how do you turn it into a question? Because when you go through that inverted Y model, I talked about earlier, at the PF level, you don't have the question intonation. That is at the phonetic sound level. 
but at the meaning level it must be construed as a question okay so cleft the cleft question format of grammar is a clever way of doing exactly that that is you're doing a bit of your grammar uh, sorry bit of your question semantics in your grammar the grammar reorients and instead of asking a direct question turns it into a cleft question and that i think is actually uh, uh, highlighting uh, a genuine explanation in 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 the language okay so um, i will go back to what chomsky was saying what is a genuine explanation this is a genuine explanation which uh, invokes the interfaces and at the same time also tells you how children in these groups of languages acquire this form of questioning why don't they get you know influenced by the other speakers surrounding them why don't they start talk uh, talk asking questions in non cleft you know version or wh version so this is the reason that the interface pressures to turn it into a question semantically changes the grammar and that's why the grammar on surface looks different but you are now able to find a genuine explanation now as uh, uh, i was reminded that i don't have time left so in fact the last part which is actually the longer part will have to remain um, incomplete but i will uh, go through uh, some of the slides um, and i will tell you in briefly what i wanted to talk about um, uh, in the abstract i talked about this uh, how did these two groups come to have similar syntactic features right because they they were never in contact okay and genetically if you profile them they are quite different as well dravidian and tibeto burman so one possibility obvious possibility is another major group in fact of the east and northeast which is the munda or the austroasiatic group of languages santali uh, mundari etc munda languages so here uh, the possibility is that this is a carrier group carrier so it carries it carries the features on to itself and then has contact with dravidian very simplistic kind of idea so for that to show you need to look at the dravidian austroasiatic admixture and you have to look at the austroasiatic tibeto burman admixture i have done both and there are plenty of examples i have looked at linguistic examples i have looked at classification criteria of languages i have looked at space geography i have looked at migration i've looked at migration meaning genetics as well and i've looked at archaeology unfortunately i cannot go through all that but um, i will come to the thesis that i would like to propose so i'm skipping all of these and uh, some of these you may be familiar with and uh, okay so you can look at this urheimans this is the uh, very well known uh, you know place of origin for austroasiatic languages you can see from southeast asia austroasiatic homeland urheimats german word i put it plural because i'm going to superimpose the tibeto burman urheimat on top of it top of this so the tibeto burman urheimat is uh, like this also from china or um, uh, which is uh, sort of bordering southeast uh, asia so roughly the same kind of region and corridor and there are plenty of chances of these two groups of languages coming together so i think there is no doubt about that people have also shown various evidence this is a genetic evidence to show that uh, tb and austroasiatic shared this o2a m95 haplogroup very clearly um the uh, uh, and you know the reasons <clears throat> the ground for the admixture of tb and austroasiatic are three like later aryanization aryanization of the tract and substratum influence in middle indo aryan and there are certain textual references so again i won't be going through that but i will come to this last part which take me 2 minutes and i highlight bengal undivided bengal because i think it's a great case to prove the hypothesis so we are saying that okay maybe austroasiatic carried the features from tibeto burman to dravidian okay but let's look at bengal bengal was really dravidian till very late till even 300 400 uh, ce bengal was majorly dravidian and also munda 
So languages like Orao, North Dravidian languages, Mal Pahari Mal languages, Munda languages like Bhumi, Santali, were the languages of Western Bengal. And uh, Bodo and Khasi were the languages of North Bengal and East Bengal, even until as late as 300, 400 CE. Moreover, the toponymy, place names in Bengal preserve some Dravidian and Munda roots. There are many examples. Suniti Kumar Chatterjee has discussed this as well. So uh, things like Jola, Joti, Juli, Hitti, Bhitti, Bhitti, Gadda, Handa, these are Dravidian roots. Bhada, Kunda, all these are in uh, with some uh, place name, you add this. Um, so the idea is that probably the Dravidians retreated from these lands uh, much later, maybe after the arrival of the Tibet Burman. And the new tentative hypothesis that I'm proposing is that the Dravidian and Tibeto Burman admixture might have happened in the East itself. Okay. And this is a genetic map that I'm fond of. I've shown this elsewhere as well. This shows the diversity of the East of India. Okay. So this I'm titling as Eastern origin of diversity. If you take one of these, I should have put an arrow, the, the one of this cycle uh, circles, uh, which shows further the uh, number of haplogroups, genetic profile, the maximum number of haplogroups in any one place is actually in East India. Okay, so it has 12 haplogroups, okay, representing Indo Aryan, Dravidian, Munda, Tibeto Burman, all sorts of you know races and ethnicity. So one thing that is strikingly clear from the above distribution is the extent of diversity in the East as compared to any other region. It has as many as like 12 uh, haplogroups present in one geographical area. And this is indicative of a true melting pot. Finally, this is uh, almost the final slide before the conclusion. There is a Tibeto Burman substratum in Bengal as well. Again, place names, I've given some examples. There's some pujas or rituals which uh, have these names, then certain sort of music and uh, in phonetics, morphology as well, you have some evidence, okay? So uh, I conclude therefore, uh, three things, part one, part two, part three, part one, decolonize Northeast linguistics, how Northeast linguistics to be done, okay? We need to source our own material. Part two, underlying axis, like let's say Dravidian and Tibetan government, such access help us realize sort of true types of languages, types of languages. If a language like Maitilan or Naga languages have a propensity of turning everything into a fact or a nominal, it's saying something about the language, okay? Two types of languages and their interface organizations, that is their relation with sound and meaning. Part three, the Eastern corridor for contact of major axis of Indian civilization where all three older language families come in contact. And of course, later Aryanization, which was complete by 700 uh, CE. In fact, uh, from Orisha, uh, Aryanization uh, happened, uh, Dravidians retreated even much later. So this whole range of Eastern Bihar, Magad, uh, West Bengal, East Bengal, Assam, uh, Orisha, and Andhra was one unbroken land which was you know, at different stages Aryanized later on. But this land was mostly Dravidian and Munda land. And they retreated, giving space for the new colonies, the new colonizers. And that's how uh, things can be revealed if we care to look more clearly or more uh, carefully at the underlying patterns. So I'll stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, um, Tanmay sir, for such a wonderful uh, talk on um, understanding the diachronic syntax and evolution and development of and the interrelationship between Tibetan Burman and Dravidian. Of course, it's an unfinished story because there was so much sir had to say, but um, because of the time limit and um, because of um, the discussion that has to go, so somehow we had to come to the end of the session here. Um, I hope there will be um, pretty lot of questions from the audiences present here. 
both in YouTube and in Zoom. So uh, all of you are requested to kindly, um, those in Zoom are kindly requested to unmute yourself and ask questions. You can raise hands also, or, or you can leave questions in the chat box. And those in YouTube live can also uh, leave their questions there and Bijan uh, will follow it up in <clears throat> Zoom. Yeah. yeah, some questions in the chat box. So uh, 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 Professor Kaling is saying, uh, this is an excellent example, just a comment. Yes, I think I deliberately chose that example. So thank you for noticing that. Priyanku is saying, I wish we had examples numbered. They were numbered, Priyanku. One, two, three. These are the three examples that I looked at. But the Mytheloan examples with cleft are not numbered. But since it's not a syntax talk and I had so much to say, I did not number them. Um, but I can go back to them anytime. Padamlal Bharti from Nepal is saying we... Uh, will we be able to receive these slides so that we can refer to them again? Yes, I'll make a handout and send it to you. You uh, please contact the organizers. They will give you my email or I'll just type it here, my email, and you can write to me. I'll create a handout and um, I will mail it to you personally. Uh, um, handout is important because slide uh, is, uh, does not tell you the full story. Handout will have the footnotes, the references, everything. So I think you should want the handout and then you can quote me or cite me properly. <clears throat> Dhiren is asking, thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you, Dhiren. Um, yes, uh, the talk will be archived or, yeah, archived in Tibla name, uh, YouTube channel. That's that's it. Any any questions, any other questions, Monali? Okay. Yes, Monali, I think... I um, Mimi. Yes, yes. And Dr. Hawkeep has a question and so also Mimi. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Taji, for that wonderful uh, talk. It opens up uh, uh, many corridors for future um, research. So forgive me uh, if I pour out my ignorance about the talk, but these are the following questions that I have. Uh, so you talk about that irregular, uh, what it called, uh, <clears throat> uh, question words that is very common in most Tibetan languages uh, we work with. Uh, Rome is one, and in Kukichin languages, uh, the nominalizer also uh, is very much there in the, in the formation of uh, the uh, participatory relative clause. So the, in, in Kukichin, it is mostly marked by the prefixal R. Now, I, I'm most, mostly uh, intrigued by your, uh, what do you call, uh, this Dravidian, uh, Tibetan Burman, uh, what do you call, confluence uh, through what do you call, this corridor called mm. Nordis and Bengal. In <clears throat> uh, more specifically, uh, if we are to assume uh, what you say is true, that uh, this, uh, what you call this uh, irregular uh, question words uh, of the sort that you mentioned for Manipuri uh, was uh, passed on from Tibetan Burman via, uh, via uh, uh, astroasiatic languages. Uh, which astroasiatic languages are you referring to here or are there a group of astroasiatic languages? Do Hasi have this sort of construction? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I'm coming there <laughs> before I complete. Okay. Uh, let me put because coming back again and again would be difficult. Yes, yes. So, uh, so uh, I'm not very sure about the uh, what call, origins of uh, Indo Aryan. Uh, if we assume that, uh, uh, not Indo Aryan, but in Astro Asiatic, if the origin of Astro Asiatic is somewhere in South East Asia, somewhere in Thailand or Cambodia, or whatsoever that region, and um, uh, so. Uh, would it not be the other way around that the construction of the sort that you talk about the irregular uh, what you call question words or the nominalization process were well, first developed in, in in South India in the in the in the in the, in the Dravidian belt and somewhere uh, it got sneaked sneak into a debatable area via perhaps via to uh, into uh, in, uh, to associated and lastly. Uh, I, perhaps this talk is not complete. Lost you. Lost you, Bautam. Uh, we can't uh, hear you, um, keep Your voice is inaudible. Yeah, some problem with connection. I'll answer his question, though. 
the first question of course that is possible but then you have to look at the migration pattern so the migration pattern is that uh, uh, even if roughly the same area slightly higher and lower kind of southeast asia bottom of southeast asia and through myanmar to the northeast is um, talking about the austro asiatic uh, migration and tibet to burma like i have uh, shown in earlier work the uh, and other people also also uh, the two kind of routes one through the tibet to himalayan and the other through the again the same route as myanmar and uh, uh, northeast india and maybe through actually north myanmar um, so those possibilities are there but then you have to look at the penetration so tibet to burma actually did not penetrate much and i have in another work shown that it is probably because of this toponymy in bengal at least not in orissa you probably would expect that uh, there were tibet burman presence in that tract uh, before the, before aryanization of the place and <clears throat> and in the old text often talk about uh, um, giratas being near a water body you know that tibet to himalayan route or even the south burma route does not have the what i mean not burma route does not have water body so it is quite likely that it is you know the whole tibet to burman region probably was extended all the way to bay of bengal through bengal um so at the border of let's say orissa that's that's the range let's say tb but the austro asiatic as we know very clearly infiltrated or sort of uh, went in much more so it's much deeper intrusion into the land of india and of course as you know there are lots of theorists who say that munda actually originated in india but of course there are six such hypotheses and i won't waste time talking about them but the major hypothesis the genetic story the current genetic story don't even look at 2008 look at like 2016 or something uh, very clearly shows that austro asiatic migration from southeast asia into india and they are the deeper migration and they are more admixture the genetic story very clearly tells you that there are many things which are common between dravidian many haplogroups uh, and also empty dna mother side dna common between uh, austro asiatic and dravidian that's not uh, at all common with tibet to burman tibet to burman is a quote unquote uh, say, let's say more pure genetic profile and it is less less mixing with uh, i mean there's no dravidian remnant of anything tibet to burman but there is austro asiatic and you will find that more pronounced in actually meghalaya so you see that in garo uh, it is more and even um, in more than let's say uh, other tibet burman in the northeast uh, garo will have uh, more austroasiatic uh, genetic profile so those patterns are very clear and it is very unlikely to think of the other direction from dravidian to this but uh, your point is i think that if dravidian was in the east it could have easily gone into austroasiatic and then to tibet to burman but i would go along with the migration pattern direction because in the first time when i presented this i actually considered both and uh, rejected that route i i wanted to uh, be in consonance with this migration pattern into india uh, through the northeast to south india the central south india yeah mimi had a uh, hand raised for a long time yes uh, dr mimi ma'am please um, you can ask your question yes Hello, sir. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> uh, nice to see you, sir. Um, actually, this is not uh, exactly a question as such, but just an observation. And uh, uh, thank you for that interesting talk. And uh, syntactic typology is something which uh, people don't really talk about. And uh, um, bringing together of languages. Um, by comparing the syntax that is uh, something which uh, i have also been uh, i mean dabbling with uh, in the past one or two years and so th this is something which uh, um, now there was one data which you had uh, in your um, in your slide that mm. is uh, the word for together where mm. you had said together and uh, uh, with the with the normalizer um, suffix yeah um, is it possible to say that uh, it is actually the the uh, width and the reciprocal is it which makes it together so with each other 
mix it together. <coughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so you'll think it's a reciprocal, uh, but the reciprocal marker would be different, right? It is a reciprocal. Uh, I mean, the root is reciprocal without a reciprocal marker. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It yes. Is so maybe there is a reciprocal marker there. And uh, because um, in in uh, in some languages the reciprocal marker and the normalizer they are the same, you ah. know? so maybe the, the analysis of that could be yeah. Wow, ah, mm. I mean that uh, slide you're talking about that the found. verbal reciprocal, yeah. Ah, yeah. The verbal re reciprocal. So maybe uh, two is it two throng? No, no, that's something else. So with each other could maybe bring about uh, the word together and not mm. together followed by. The normalizer, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So that was something which I I, I noticed, and okay, uh, maybe no, I, I thought that in in uh, in Manipuri too also this could happen. Well, in Manipuri, as far as Manipuri is concerned, this uh, definitely is the nominalizer. Uh, uh, the yeah, huppa there huppa together there definitely is the nominal. Pa is definitely is the ber nominalizer. And uh, mm. it's in pattern with the other examples that I've given. And who it's by quite, itself means together, is it? Yeah, and that's what my understanding is. But there are my non speakers here who can tell me. And it could be that, uh, you know, the root itself is kind of rec reciprocal. Uh, that's fine. But that uh, nominalizing ah, has to okay. be <clears throat> Okay. All right. And so there was another uh, query which I have been, uh, you know, like struggling with. Uh, which, uh, which which deals with um, with language contact. Now, mm. supposing you have a group of, of languages, you know, and uh, uh, and these group of languages they have a set of features which uh, which which is binding them together. Mm. Now, let's say that there are five features. I think there's an interruption there. Mm. Can I continue? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So let's say that there are a set of five features and one language is showing all the five features mm. and the other languages are showing maybe one or two features. Yeah. Now, is it possible to call uh, that one language which is showing these, all these five, five features as the, as the supra language or yeah. would that be a yeah, mistake? That, that, I think it's a very interesting question. And uh... Again, I will invoke mm. that uh, we should not stop at looking at a certain type of features only. Okay, so I think there should be some method of uh, assigning some values uh, mm. uh, depending on the nature of the type uh, of the feature. So if it's, let's say, a syntactic feature, I would say that would require definitely some kind of um, longer contact. If it's a phonetic uh, feature, or morphophonemic feature that will be less. So accordingly, if we suppose, you know, Mimi's question, if we assign values to these features, mm -hmm. so five features you have found, are they all syntactic or is a mix of phonetic uh, and morphological features? And after- Well, one feature you you can say, yeah. After assigning okay. values- So one- uh, You'll get a number, mm -hmm. right? You get a number. And yes. that number might mm -hmm. as well be less then another language which has three features, not five, but mm. they, they have mm. higher value. Total value is higher. You know, the logic mm. of the reasoning is that I'm saying that the syntactic similarities require longer, deeper connection because syntax does not- Longer, get, deeper, yes, exactly. Mm. Does not get influenced so easily, syntactic features. Yes, so that because as you said, like, yeah, as you said, uh, these phonological features, they are at the surface level, whereas the syntactic features, they are at the deeper level, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Mm. So, um, so that, yes, kind of that, language, that was my question, yeah. Language is sort of open to now um, let itself be, you know, modified by that other language, whatever, that politically dominating or whatever, more numerous, etc. Mm. Because you see, you know, Tripura, you know, Kokborok and Bangla has stayed together for many years, it <laughs> uh, unfortunately for many more years, but the languages are not changing. I mean, there are similarities on top, borrowing, in fact, borrowing is happening of uh, mm -hmm. particles, discourse particles mm -hmm. that you find uh, in Nagaland also. But the true nature of the language does not change. Mm -hmm. And what I was trying to say today, highlighting the true nature of the language, 
we have to do a deep study to understand why is this language so uh, fond of you know nominalizing different kinds of things not just one ba with the manipuri examples but relative clauses are nominalized this kind of things clefts are nominalized why this nominalizing tendency that is telling us something about the language and i think that would tell us something about mm. the uh, he, uh, um, the the i don't want to use the word population about the people about the indigenous indigenous people so i think this is very important to understand the true nature of language from a modern perspective and syntactic okay. then another to... query on yeah. along the same lines is mm. yeah another query along the same lines is uh, is it more um, easy to borrow a feature from another language or is it more easy for a language to drop a feature well it's very complicated because they're all now supposing the feature the feature of normalization okay now is it easier to to adopt a feature from another language or the feature of normalization or is it easier to drop the feature of of normalization totally from the language yeah again i i think we cannot give like an answer to that question again i would say that again it will differ from like one example is nominalization okay but let's say you take relative mm, pronouns yeah. okay or take a verbal reflexivizer mm. or a reciprocal marker inside the verb or negation depending on the uh, you know syntactic contribution of that little element it will decide uh, the droppability quote unquote of that mm. Mm. or acquisition of that feature so i think languages mm. have their own dynamics and that is a job which i think one can figure out without going too deep also one can just map you know languages and the dialects and try to mm. see what is uh, what i'm trying to say mimi here is that there are certain things in languages certain features in languages which are more crucial than other features and the typologist or the syntactician nobody has actually paid attention to that fact that not all features are to be given the same kind of value when you talk of let's say the nature of language whether the language has changed or not what do you mean by change you know is it phonetic change morphological change syntactic mm. change mm. or is it really the character of the language is changing like i'm economizing my expressions mm. i've learned this sort of economizing an expression instead of saying that uh, that uh, you know um, the book which is lying on the table i i, I can say um, the uh, on table lying book so i'm kind of economizing my expression mm. by relativizing this relative uh, participle that i'm making so that's i think a very deeper strategy linguistic strategy which of course speakers are not aware but i think as a linguistic feature when that happens or affects the language has truly changed so this is i think a task which is difficult but on the other hand i think we can statistically map this okay uh, Tanmay. this is an interesting feature yeah thank you thank you sir thank you mimi shri uh, kumar yes please yeah tanmay just i wanted to add on what uh, mimi had just said uh, uh, her uh, she, uh, her query was whether nominalization could be borrowed into a language and uh, for that i think we have a very good example from uh, dakini dakini has uh, nominalization mm -hmm. and it is uh, uh, yeah you can uh, imagine well imagine from where it has come it is from dravidian languages yeah. which are in contact with it yeah Yeah. yeah 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 yes actually my query was not whether norm but i was just taking normalization as an example yeah, of a yeah. feature no, you know so yeah yeah, yeah okay then it, thank it, you the answer remains the same like she comes to yes like if the mm. language finds nominalizing as a very good you know tool it will adapt it it's not that uh -huh. there are 100 speakers surrounding you nominalizing all the time you know you imagine like 100 manipuri surrounding me and saying all kinds of expression ba all the time it's not that i'm going to change my bangla and change the adjective into a nominal okay but if i find that okay. fit in my language strategy very efficiently okay that's why i think this generative grammar paradigm is very useful because the notion of economy mm. in language within a particular derivation is already there the methodology is there all the results are there we just have to adopt it in our dialect study or typological study etc and we'll be able to answer such questions then 
Okay. Questions? Maybe I could uh, email you further. Of course, yeah. yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you, um, Mimi, ma'am, and Shukumar, sir, for your questions and being a part of the discussion. There's another question in the chat box. Um, yeah. From Dimple? Dimple. Yeah. yeah. I'm working on one of the Indonesia TV subgroup, Arunachal, as you have mentioned about the use of Tho with the numeral term as Du Tho in the former part of the presentation. Do you think the term has come from mother tongue as the term is seen in few of TV languages, Boro? Miju, Ligaru, and many more. I won't know. I mean, this very particular thing that you're asking. Um, use of to, I see to, I see. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Arunachal, it's a linguistic situation is very interesting. The sort of diversity is flattening, which is not true for, yeah, this diversity part, I didn't get to talk about with this census. At this time, I can talk about it. Like, um, I've done a recent couple of papers, very general papers for an encyclopedia we published from Routledge on language and migration and language. Um, yeah, language and migration is one which is relevant for us, where actually I've looked at in detail at the census figures and found Manipur and Nagaland to be the most diverse of the states in India in terms of language. So there are 14, uh, 17 mother tongues in, uh, 17 slash 16 mother tongues in both Manipur and Nagaland and not all, and there are only three, four which are kind of uh, same, but uh, otherwise they're different. And on the other hand, the you know, situation in the North is very, very different. Migration patterns, if you look at, in terms of census figures, you only notice that uh, there have been migration from Assam rather than towards Assam. Okay, from Assam to Meghalaya, to the sort of uh, uh, Chin, Koki Chin, Chin land, the Koki land, you know, migration into Mizoram and Tripura, everywhere it has happened. And <clears throat> this is a story which never gets told actually the uh, migration within the Northeast. And what is happening in Arunachal is uh, interesting because I think the diversity, which is a hallmark of the Northeast uh, in terms of languages is kind of flattening, okay? Of course, there's various ways to look at it. We'll say that, well, there, this is not one language, but 10 language, but you know, the onus is on you to prove that these are 10 different languages, but broadly as linguists, you know, well sort of, aware and trained linguist would be able to figure out then the number of languages, the speakers, number of speakers of the indigenous languages is kind of reducing. And one obvious culprit, of course, is the influence of Hindi in, the, in Arunachal. And it could be that Tho is a particular kind of migration that has happened into it. But um, I, won't, I won't say that the, uh, it's a deep feature of these languages. Uh, because uh, many of these Borugaro groups have this, uh, you know, widespread use of uh, classifiers. So they, they, they wouldn't need to borrow uh, like to or something, which is a very uh, sort of, uh, you know, broad classifier. It's, not, it's like very general classifier. It's not a very typical classifier. Yeah. Any other queries? Okay, uh, Monali, uh, my yes, yes. Uh, yes. before low, so I have one question, last question. Okay. Uh, the first question is, uh, how do you account for uh, the pre legal pre presence of uh, retroflex sound in uh, Tibetan Burma languages, which uh, we found quite robust in uh, Dravidian languages? Mm -hmm. so one. Mm -hmm. And the second one is, uh, we tend to look as linguists, uh, all uh, what it could, we tend to look at uh, these typological similarities from the uh, perspective of language context. Uh, if uh, so, what if uh, a language or uh, I agree to the extent that uh, these are due to cultural uh, similarities? At one point of time, there should be some kind of uh, what you call a transition or some kind of um, sharing of uh, what you call culture. So if you find such construction in other language family outside of India, say, because our knowledge isn't so, if we happen to have such features, so uh, would it be wise to say that these are uh, due to shared cultural features and nothing to do with uh, language context? Can, it, can that also be one way of looking at it? And like, just as we account for uh, typological, uh, uh, what do you call, sameness or differences on, on the basis of uh, language universal. Uh, yeah, first question. Second question, I don't understand very well. 
but the first question yeah this is the point if you listen to my talk that you know retroflex and those are features are something which uh, first of all emenu was not the first person to point out retroflex okay it's been shown in fact that indo european has some retroflex as well so it's not um, uh, certainly it's not you know the point is the whole point and the discussion for last 15 minutes the whole point of this talk is that we we are able to distinguish between a uh, certain type of features phonetic phonological morphological features versus syntactic features okay and the uh, my argument is that if syntactic features which are similar that definitely indicates at some point there was two languages whether they were either contact together or through some other third party uh, you know contact happened so it is not that uh, dravidian has certain things which are not there in tibeto burman therefore this thesis is nullified or that tibeto burman has certain features which dravidian doesn't have therefore it's nullified that doesn't really disprove the theory there are scores of features i can give you from tibeto burman which are not there in dravidian that's not the point the point is to look at the kind of type of features that we're talking about and these are not just simple typological features these are syntactic features which at the same time have a deep impact on the interfaces that is the sound that is articulatory perceptual interface and the conceptual intentional interface broadly but wrongly the sasurian idea of sound and meaning it's not correct but then that is what uh, we understand it so that kind of uh, similarity if you find that must be considered very significant and i'm trying to figure out why that happened now the second question is about that there is a danger of generalizing the cultural archetype well it may be found outside sure and for the same reason because one could say that this uh, you know this uh, geogra geographical boundaries are the constitutional boundaries nation state boundaries but linguistic boundaries are kind of different right because china southeast of china if you look at there are 52 languages we don't know don't even know about most of them right so that's a diversity again in the periphery and from there if you look at if you look at forget about language if you look at rituals you know in the whole of southeast asia from north from vietnam all the way down to let's say even bordering malaysia burma and northeast you find lots of similarities in uh death rituals birth rituals all kinds of things and this has been this have been studied also so this is one continuum it's fine if it is outside the you know map of india that's fine but it could be the same reason cultural architect but it might be a danger to equate cleft questions with let's say politeness okay all the time because there could be uh, there could be other reasons for having cleft question right so that's that's valid but uh, you know this is a, a road map to kind of inquiries that we should be engaged with and this would be a road map which would lead us to you know sort of our you know sourcing our kinds of uh, understanding of languages not somebody coming from outside and looking at some bunch of tibeto burman languages collecting data and publishing papers but a deep understanding looking at the civilizational aspect of uh migration people coming together separating other uh, aspects like aryanization etc so that is the idea of this uh, presentation and um, i think uh, we'll take up last question from the chat box um, that is from um, suranjana suranjana Guruva. thanks for your talk sir uh, with regard to uh, austroasiatic being hypothesized as a carrier group are there any specific features you found in austroasiatic tv admixture that are not in the dravidian austroasiatic admixture no i haven't thought that's a good question i haven't thought of that uh, because uh, if you look at sobara's book also if you look at verbal reflexive reciprocals it's again a continuum from tibetan verbal through austroasiatic to dravidian again in exclusion of um indo-aryan and very clear exclusion you cannot uh, reconstruct it in indo aryan in any form and uh, um, uh, much clearer than let's say relative clauses the relative clauses this participial relative clauses as i gave an example you can with difficulty construct in hindi bangla gujarati marathi also but um, it's rare 
but this kind of verbal reflexes which it involve which involves this morphological feature of uh, verbal reflexes you just can't do it cleft questions you can't do it okay so i think um, i have not noticed thing uh, syntactic features which are common in tb austroasiatic which are uh, not the dravidian among the things that i have looked at uh, negative verbs you know you'll find it in of course dravidian and tb i'm looking at but there are some features which are there in dravidian and tb but not there in austroasiatic that's possible um, that uh, austroasiatic lost it but surendra i would ask you to reconsider this career thesis because i didn't have time so maybe you missed it at the end i said this career thesis is not well supported and in fact then i talked about bengal the east corridor is probably the place where before the dravidians were retreating or pushed out the tibetan governments were already there and ad mixing happened there so it's quite possible that there's a direct contact Thank you, um, thank you, Suranjana, for your question, and um, thank you very much, uh, Tanmay sir, for being a part of um, in this discussion. It was a very heavy topic, and I'm sure many of them have many more questions. And I have given um, uh, sir's email ID once again in the chat box, so you can mail it to him, and uh, you can carry on the discussion in the Gmail as well. Um, I would like to request. Uh, Uh, Dr. Bobita Sarangtem to kindly give vote of thanks as we have come to the end of our session. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Monali, and a very good evening to all. It's my uh, proud privilege to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of Tiblenai. I take this opportunity to express a gratitude to Professor Tanmoy Vatacharya for graciously accepting our invitation and encouraging us. and the talk on relating tibeto burman to dravidian and unfinished story is so interesting and illuminative sir thank you agachari sir for giving such a wonderful talk and i would also like to thank our panelists for being here thank you all once again for joining us today and we will see you next time uh, till then bye bye and good night for the day thank you thank you Thank you, Thank you Manali and Vitan uh, Pawthan it was a great pleasure Thank you thank you all very much and uh, we all we'd also like to announce that um, the next speaker for the special talk series will be Professor Shobhana Chelia um sometime in uh, mid to late october and between that we will also be having student presentations so we will give the update in our facebook page and would we'll also inform to all of you in uh, whatsapp and mail as well so thank you everyone and uh, thank you Bye. very much sir